Um, and so right. what we cover, I can see. <laughs> Share screen. Okay, so um, can you see that screen, Joe? Yeah, yeah. Good, good. good. Okay, so um, we're going to cover a couple of different techniques for lead generating in the MLS that some people are aware of and others are not. And so uh, the first one that I wanted to bring to people's attention. Um, is under the tools section. So there's a bunch of things in the tools section that people can use to lead generate that they don't necessarily pay attention to. So I'm gonna pop open tools. Mine looks a little different than, than agent versions because I have a brokerage version. So I have the red office management one here uh, and syndication. But for the rest, it's all the same as yours. So they, one or two things might move one way or the other, but the reality is it's the same deal. Um, the first thing that I wanna to mention to anybody who's watching this video, uh, and Jessica who's here too, uh, and Joe obviously who's here, um, is that there is a tool called Remine, which is, uh, which is a free tool created by a guy that I know. He makes a lot of money from it. Hey, Mike. Um, and so the first thing I want to bring up is that this tool, Remind, if you do not know how to use it yet, you should go learn how to use it. <clears throat> and so um, it will require that you set up and create an account for yourself. Um, and we can get into this in a moment, but I just want to make sure that before anything else that we don't, uh, that we don't neglect to mention that Remind is a free tool. There is a paid version of it, and then there's the version that MLS gives you for free. So um, what we can do with it is actually wildly powerful. And so we'll get back around to that, but it's a different software package. So I just want to make you aware of that first and foremost. Um, so let's start with a different tool called public record. And remember, if one of you guys can just remind me to come back to Remind, I can show you some of what that can do. Um, and so let's start with public record. And so in going to lead generate, one of the things we want to decide is where do I want to lead generate, right? So part of it might be the geolocation. And so if I wanted to go find, and you guys remember I live in Groton, and so that's 01450. And I said, I want to go to Groton and find anybody who's what's considered an absentee owner. And what absentee owner means is that they list in the public record a different address to which they receive mailings than the address of the actual property. Doesn't necessarily mean that they don't live there, but it increases the likelihood that they are investors. And so all we would do um, is we go to the zip code or the town or whatever it was that you wanted to use. Uh, we see absentee owner here. And uh, I like to point out that anytime you don't know what this thing does, you can click on this lollipop. It's not really a lollipop, just looks like a lollipop. It's a magnifying glass. It says you're supposed to say Y or N. And in this case, we want it to be yes, they are in fact absentee owners. And so once I have done that, I can click the search now button and it will give me a list of everybody, 1,660 people, by the way, which is way too many as far as I'm concerned, um, people who are not living in the residence that, that public record is listed there. Now, what I do wanna show you is see this right here where there's a trust involved, highly likely that the Wheeler Lane Realty Trust um, may or may not be a primary residence for them. However, um, this is a good initial indicator of people who might be more likely to sell. And so one of the things you could do is you could craft a letter <clears throat> and the letter would say something like this, uh, dear Mr. D'Agostino, because he's the first one on the list, John, John and Richard, uh, dear Mr. D'Agostino, uh, I am writing this letter to inquire as to whether you have been selling. Uh, as you may or may not know, uh, home prices have 
increased by 23% in town, whatever the numbers, uh, in the past 12 months. Uh, just curious to know if you thought of selling. I have many buyers who would be interested. Uh, please reach out should you have any interest. Respectfully, Mark. Right? Something as simple as that. Uh, and so you could basically uh, grab this 1,660 records um, and you could select them all. Watch what I do here. Select. Say I wanted to send to 1,660 people. I click labels. It makes labels. It's going to be, this is the format, three labels per row, 10 labels per page. Um, and the label type is the owner type. And then if you want to say or current resident, which you want it to do, um, you check a box. And then you go print these labels. And if you go down to staples, uh, you can buy sheets of labels um, and get those. And you can print those and send them out. And so, um, yeah, so that's that's number one thing. So I don't know if you guys caught what I did there, but basically all I did was I checked the box for the ones that I was interested in sending to. And I can click the labels button. Um, and I have used, in this instance, absentee owner as the... Uh, as the indicator as to whether I want to send something to them. So remind me, we'll get back to the remind stuff because it uses a lot more analytics uh, in the in the formatting. But for for the purposes of this exercise, we could also do this. Let's say I was only interested in finding those people with five or more acres. And I added that to our search. And we were guys right now we're at 1660. Now we're down to none. I went too high. <laughs> Those absentee owners apparently live in three acres plus. Um, so let's see if we've got any at three. Okay, so we do. We've got 499 with three or more acres. And so, um, and again, if we were to go look at it, see right now we've got uh, 152 Wyman Road and we've got Nathan and Jennifer. Uh, when I click on it, Public record says these guys actually live in Drakeit. This is their summer joint, right? They live on, on Wyman Road. Um, and so this might be something that they own because the family had it before. It might be that it's a summer joint. It might be Windowsville. It might be investment property. And so, um, and we see that they, have, so we can, we can do as much research as we want. We could do them one-offs. Again, uh, most of you guys have time, not money. So if that's the case, do a little more research, send a little less mail. Um, if you, have enough money to send out 1,660 letters, print them all and do it again. Um, and set some kind of regular basis. I'm gonna to touch base with them quarterly. Because the reality, guys, is that um, just like with any mailing, uh, absentee owners, it's gonna be at the right time. You hit them at the right time, they call you, life is good. Um, and so this is a methodology for getting listings. And what do we want right now most of all? More listings. So um, that's that's absentee owners, and so they're likely to be investors. Anyone have any questions relative to the absentee owners? Any commentary, Anthony? You're you're off mute. No, I'm good. Didn't know I was off mute, but thank you. You're green. You're green. Right? green bar around you. We're all very excited. Okay, so let's talk about other people that we might be uh, looking to reach out to. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go back up to our absentee owner and I'm gonna just delete it. Faces around. Um, so here we go. Boom, delete. We no longer care about absentee owners. What if we wanted to work with builders, guys? Um, let's delete the acreage. And so there's there's different places where I can go to find multiple listings, right? And so I encourage all of you as licensees to build relationships with different target people who can get you more than one listing this year. And so one of those would be investors, right? We just looked at that. Another would be attorneys, right? Divorce attorneys, estate attorneys, uh, probate, because those are people who have a regular stream of business that includes listings, right? Or potentially includes listings. So if you can forge relationships with people who have multiple listings, life is good. You can have multiple listings on an annual basis. You should work towards having three to five of these people in your world. If you have three to five of these people in your world, your world could be monumentally different next year. 
So um, these are people that you want to do that with. The, another class of person with multiple listings for you is builders. And so one of the ways to get builders, and this is historically true, uh, would be to identify land, bring the land to the builder. Historically, the builder, if you can find and identify the land, bring them the land, they purchase the land, they'll usually want you to discount your commission on the land, and then they'll give you the listings very often. And so did you guys, were you guys aware of that? Were you aware of that? I know they sometimes want like a smaller amount for each of link if they choose you to be their agent. Like, so for instance, am I allowed to say numbers or percentages? You can say percentages. Yeah, we're all in the same family. So if you start like saying like, oh, I charge 3% for the list size. And then they're like, well, we can do better. Like if you're guaranteed a certain model home plus X amount of units coming onto the market with their buildable plan, yep. then you can kind of negotiate. Yeah, build, builders typically want you to take two and a half percent, by the way. They're, they're not going to give you more than that. They're, they're looking at you and going, you're a five percent guy. You're getting two and a half. I want you to offer two and a half. That's how that typically goes. And so it, out in Western Mass, where if you're offering two percent, they're going to say, you're a four and a half guy. You can, you can have two and a half and offer two. Um, but again, the reality is that the builders, if you bring them good land, they will typically reward you with the listings. And as long as you don't screw it up, you can have those listings, even if they have existing relationships with other agents. So um, historically, to go get a builder, you go find and identify a nice parcel of land, go create an opportunity for them, bring that to them, and negotiate that work. Very often, like I said, you'll end up taking a bat on the commission on the front end um, in exchange for a promise of listings on the back end, which they may or may not keep up. Um, builders are notoriously, <laughs> yeah, builders are notoriously jerky. They're jerky. Um, but so let's let's use um, our what's uh, let's see oh one four three one is that Ash for him or is that oh one four three one is that Ashby? Um, that let's let's find out. Um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say I want two lots at least um, in Massachusetts. A and R lots historically are a couple hundred feet of frontage and two acres. Um, so if you've got a couple acres and a mule and a couple hundred feet of frontage, you're your what's an ANR lot is typically what's available. It's called ANR, approval not required. And so um, if you were to type that in there and say, I want two plus, so I want four or more acres of land. And again, um, what we can also do to, to narrow this down, I could either just do it by acreage. Let's do that first. Um, oh, who kicked me out? I. <laughs> it was Ashley, sorry. It is actually. Um, you'd think I would know that I own the house. Set. Um, we're in public records. Let me go yell at the front desk so they don't kick me out again. Give me a second, guys. Hey, ma'am. Uh, can you check my house? <laughs> no worries. All right, Pam kicked me out. Um, okay, so here we go again. Uh, we're gonna go back to Ashby 01431. Uh, we are looking for acreage at this point. And so we're, because we're going to find builders and we want at least four acres of land. And so when we hit the search button on that, this is parcels that have four or more acres. There's 576 records. When I look at that, I go, that's way too many for me to look through. By the way, I could look through all these. If I've got time and not money, I could spend some time looking through here. Um, however, one thing that I can also do, see where it says state use code up here, guys, we can narrow the search by clicking on our lollipop and see what kind of land do we want to use. And so ideally we want possible residentially developable or residentially potentially developable land, 130 or 131. Uh, or 129, right? I want it to be residential land, residential developable, or potentially developable land. And so if I click those things, I've got the use codes in here, 129, 130, 131. I search now, the number has gone down to 78. Now I only have 78 public records to go through and I can start identifying people. Um, by the way, in these things, normally RT is Realty Trust, so a lot of these you'll see are going to be realty trusts. You can also search to see um, 
By the way, if I wanted to just send labels, just like the last time I click this button here, 78 people create labels for them. I've got 30 per sheet. I've only, I'm only sending out three sheets. <laughs> it's gonna cost me three sheets of labels and stamps for 78 people and I can send them a letter. Um, dear, dear, Miss, dear Mr. and Mrs. Blah, if there is a Mr. and Mrs. Blah. Uh, by the way, if you wanted to, you can export these um, and you can export them into uh, your contact management solution called command. And then it would automatically fill in a letter if you wanted to set that up. So you could create a template letter, say, dear first name, owner one first name, or something like that. It would actually import that. So um, it's possible to do that. So let's disregard the labels. We're going to look at a couple of properties. Does anyone have any questions about this, guys? You're a very quiet group. Very quiet. All right, we we'll keep moving. Um, let's take a look at one one of these properties. Uh, so, let's. The first one here is Zero Bennett Road in Ashby. It's Lucille Carrigan who owns it. She spent ten grand on it back in 1998. It is potentially developable. So let's take a peek at this. <clears throat> it is 29.2 acres, you guys. Is this potentially developable? We all go, yep, we like potentially developable. She spent 10 grand on this parcel back in 1998. The land is currently valued according to the town at 153.7. She's paying 2,800 bucks a year in taxes. That's all we have. Now, uh, this is, this is going to be an interactive part. What might I do next, you guys? Yeah, so uh, Jess just said we might go to the registry of deeds. Take a look right up here. Owner's address is what? 376 Bennett Road, Ashby, Massachusetts. Do you think this land abuts her land, you guys? Everyone go like this. It likely does. Right? Could I go knock on her door? <laughs> I totally could. Uh, by the way, where will approve best when you do this? Um, Lucille Kerrigan. Let's go find out about Lucille Kerrigan. Um, so again, we're just we're just doing some research here, guys, right? So if I were to go, just look up Lucille and see what comes up. Um, Facebook, she's connected. Fitchburg, Massachusetts, 99% chance that's her. White Pages, 99% chance that that's her. This is not exactly the most common name in the world. Uh, somebody died in 2015. Um, she's listed. I don't know if that's her or not, but um, again, we can start checking things out, finding out what's going on. Look, there's Lucille. We got a picture of Lucille. We know what you, she's probably not going to shoot us. Uh, this is completely stereotyping, but she doesn't look like she's about to shoot us. Um, and we've got 29 acres. And so now what I can do is I can go identify in the GIS maps for Ashby, Massachusetts. We're going to see if we can't find the, par the parcel. Muni map or Ashby Mass, Mass GIS. Guys, I just typed in GIS, Ashby, Massachusetts, and uh, we can search for a location. Let's look for 376 Bennett because we don't know uh, what the other one is and just see if there's another parcel attached to it. So now it's just zoomed to that section in the map. And there's this other house there. It looks like she's surrounded by 29 acres, give or take. Would you guys guess that that is true? Anybody who's willing to say hi? <laughs> Bunch of looks bastards. about right. <laughs> Mike, Mike says, yeah, it looks about right. Guys, I just identified. Who's going to be the first one to call Mrs. Mrs. whatever her name is? I was going to call her Mrs. Bennett, um, who lives on Bennett Road. Her name is, in fact, Mrs. Kerrigan from Bennett Road. Um, and she's got 30 plus acres, right? Because she's got a couple acres right here. And then she owns this right up at Watetic Mountain Road. Check out the frontage, you guys. She's got frontage right here. 
She's got frontage right here. She's got wet, which is problematic, right? So she's going to have to stay away from this. But I, we know for an actual factual that with the frontage, based on this being frontage, we could go click, there's a lot. Click, there's a lot. Click, there's a lot. Click, there's a lot. So I'm looking at this with no information whatsoever. And I've got one, two, three, four buildable lots on her land right now. Now, they bought it for a reason. Maybe she wants it to stay that way. Um, but she's right off Watatic Mountain Road, which is a gorgeous road, um, right on the mountain road for Mount Watatic. Beautiful, beautiful countryside. Um, and so would be really, really cool to be able to build some homes there. And they would sell all day long. So this is the type of thing that we can do to find land that would be attractive to builders. So you go build rapport with Mrs. Kerrigan and or her heirs and or whatever, get it in, find out some information about her. By the way, she's on Facebook. It said she was on Facebook. So you want to just go try to friend her on Facebook and not a stocky, weird way. Um, but go comment on something, see if you have mutual friends. You guys get the drill on this, right? This is like Sherlock Holmes sleuth stuff. And we basically just go and look for land. And then when we find the land, if you guys don't know a builder, you can go find builders. The way that we find builders, by the way, typically, this is not an MLS trick. The way to find a builder is to get up at five in the morning and go sit at the local coffee shop. Who comes into coffee shops at five in the morning, you guys? Cops and builders. And just hang out there until you start beating builders. And you hang out there on a regular basis until you can build a relationship with them. And that's the way to do that. Sorry about the five o'clock part. That's just how it goes. <laughs> that's just how it goes. Um, by the way, the subs are not up at five o'clock, most of them. It's not the subs. They're all hung over. <laughs> it's the GCs. So, um, so just so you know. All right. Any questions on what we've just done? Anybody like the idea of working with builders? Anybody alive? Yes. I'm never teaching a class again, Chelsea, <laughs> never. I'm never teaching a class again if you guys don't talk to me. <laughs> I work with them in my other job, so some are great, some are very brutal, so. The, the GCs? Yes, oh yes. And then you have foremans you have to deal with if they're big enough, and yeah. then they're just like black and day deal, trying to get answers. So the other thing you can do, guys, by the way, to, to, um, to find builders, you can go in, uh, you can just Google builders near me and you'll find lists of builders. Uh, and you could go into the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Division of Professional Licensure and look up GC, general contractors, and find people who have a GC license. Uh, and you can meet builders that way as well, right? So um, no questions on this? You guys are cool with this. Yes, no, maybe so. Okay. So um, that was our first example of builders. Again, those of you who are smart wrote Lucille Kerrigan's name down um, so you can go meet her. She's up on the wood ticket road there. We're going to get rid of this and we're going to go back to MLS. So that, that's a good way to go and you can do it in any town. Um, again, there were not so many records. Let's do something different. Let's say I want 20 acres or more. I want a, I want a really big parcel. By the way, she would actually, she would have just disappeared, right? at 18 so that we know she's going to show up again. Um, so with 18 or more acres, we've got 24 records. And Lucille's the first one. Um, by the way, there is some science that would suggest that people move on average when, you guys? How often? Every seven to 10 years. Seven. That number has increased through COVID. Uh, and yet, uh, what we know is that every seven to, seven to 10 years, people move. That is not necessarily true of investments, so uh, keep that with a grain of salt. But as we look through when the sale date occurred, this would be a good indicator of whether we think that they're in the, they might move time frame. And so again, average means um, that there's half below, half above, right? Typically um, ish, that would be medium. Um, and yet, four years or more, people start thinking about moving very often. Okay, so uh, by the way, 
Uh, I was having a conversation with somebody yesterday, an agent in the office here, uh, who had a client who had been in a place for a year and a half. And uh, this is completely off topic, and yet I think it, it, it warrants a, a conversation. Um, one way to bring value to somebody who is about to make a lot of money on selling a property um, and then about to lose a lot of it back to Uncle Sam through capital gains would be to have the conversation if it was their primary residence that if they waited until the two year mark, they actually wouldn't have capital gains on a large chunk of the, the gains. So um, you guys are all aware of that, right? You remember that from license class that uh, we are waived $250,000 or 500 married and filing jointly in capital gains for a primary residence if we've lived there for two of the past five years. Right. So I just want to throw that out there because some of you guys might not know that or might not remember that from class. But this agent has somebody who lived there for a year and a half. And one of the first things that we discussed was, hey, you might want to just show them that you're not in this completely for the money and you wouldn't mind saving them some dough, even though it's not in your best interest. And that just shows that you care and you're looking out for their best interest. You're truly being a consultant. So I wanted to mention that. Um, okay. So uh, at this point, we've got a bunch of land with you know 18 or more acres. This is literally, I could go to these houses over the course of a weekend and just knock on some doors and go try to meet people. By the way, I would do it after having done a lot of research, right? I'd have gone to Facebook. I would have gone to Google and Googled them. Um, and I would go see if I know somebody who's a friend of theirs so that they can make an intro. LinkedIn, um, Instagram, Facebook, all the, all the regulars, right? Those are the places where I'd want to go. And these are all residentially potentially developable land masses. We can go look at them first, see if they have any frontage, how wet they are. Um, the GIS map helps you out with that because you can see how much wet there is. Uh, also remember that if it's all completely ledged, it's ridiculously expensive. What you'll probably find, guys, is that um, most land at this point uh, is garbage and ridiculously hard to build on, and that's why it's still there. The times when that's not true is probably something like this land that we looked at, uh, which is probably family land where Lucille bought this back in the, the late 80s uh, or late 90s, I should say, um, and uh, probably wants it so that she can keep her home protected for that. And or here's another thing. When they bought that land, it's possible they bought it and then subdivided it. So I go back to the public record to see, was that what happened? Because it was dead center in the middle of that spot, right? So at any rate, we can do some research and do some homework. Anybody have any desires to go look at um, the Middlesex South Registry of Deeds so that they can know how to do that? Or are you guys pretty comfortable with that? This is for all you silent letters up there. You guys know how to do a search at the... No. Yes, no, you don't? I do not. Okay. So we're going to just, we're going to type it in to a search. By the way, I only know that that's Middlesex County because I live there. Otherwise, I would have Googled it. I would have said, what county is Ashby, Massachusetts in? Um, Middlesex Registry of Deeds. Seems weird that it's south, by the way, and yet it is. Um, Middlesex South Registry of Deeds, Massachusetts. Boom, click on it. Okay. Here we are at the Registry of Deeds. Uh, we are going to go to Land Records. By the way, if you ever get a chance, um, Craig Reynolds, he's an attorney buddy of ours. He teaches a really cool class on this, on what to, what to do once you're there um, and things you could do. So we were gonna go look for Kerrigan, right? Kerrigan. Lucille. There are some funky things, by the way. This is the same place you would go to find book and page numbers and search. Let's look at, oh my gosh, look at Lucille. She's got uh, a certificate of municipal lien that is typically tax-based for 1991. She bought this, uh, there's an attachment to the land in 1979, tax liens, tax liens, tax liens. They discharge the tax liens, there's the deed, there's the mortgage, there's another deed for another property. Um, but these are the things that Lucille did. We can, by the way, search for the address as well. Uh, see under search options, uh, search criteria. Search criteria is the one. Um, we can go look for the name of the person. We can look for the book and page number. We 
can look for a specific document or the property. So if we wanted to, we could have done this search by property. When sometimes it says um, blah, 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 realty trust, and you can't figure out who that is, go do a search here. And sometimes even though it's taken by uh, a, a trust, there might be reference to who the trust is somewhere on the paper because you have to actually pull up the paper and it like it will say John Doe uh, trustee for the trust. And then I just go look up John Doe and now I know who the trustee is and now I know who the real owner is. Does that make sense? This is where if you guys had your faces showing, I could see if you were nodding or putting thumbs up. I still love you. I was about to say I hate you, but I love you. Um, you guys wanna look any more at registry of deeds or are you comfortable with at least kind of a big broad based go take a peek? I'm comfortable. Okay, good. Thank you. Well, good, Mark. If you, go, if you say go look at it, I want you to say uh, you're comfortable with it. What were you going to say, Mike? I'm good, Mark. Okay. Um, I, I will show you one more thing. We're going to go right back to the Registry of Deeds. Someone remember this number for me, 14016177. It's the book and page number. Okay, 14016177. So let's go back to this. 1416177. Was that right, guys? Yeah. There you go. There's the deed to that property. You click on it, you should be able to look at things. The printing on this is funky. <coughs> you have to have some things set to say, okay, I don't think this computer actually does. Maybe I did uh, view images now. Uh, and this is that record, right? I just was blowing it up for you. So there's the sellers. They sold it to Joe J. Johnson, Worcester County, Massachusetts, Lucy Carrot, and there she is. Okay, I was gonna say that doesn't seem right. <coughs> Pardon me, um, I blew it up too big. So um, at any rate, you guys get the drill, right? We can go look at the documents now. So if it's a trustee situation, go look at the bottom because somebody will have signed off on it. And so like, let's go look at page two where we see signatures in theory, right? There's the signatories. So in a trust situation, somebody signs off as the trustee, it's usually, because they're not very bright, most of them do this just trying to protect themselves, um, and they don't, they make themselves the trustees. Um, so they're the grantors and the trustees, and so you can actually go down and find out who the trust is, right? So you go, there's the name of the person, that's blah, blah for the trust. So, okay, moving on. <clears throat> now let's talk about... Uh, something that, that made me think that we probably want to do this class. It was yesterday. Uh, and one of the things that we would, uh, we would consider doing uh, would be something called a geo farm, right? So let's delete this. Uh, let's delete the acreage, make sure we have a clean screen. And we're going to, you guys want to stay in Ashby? Let's say we wanted to find everybody who lived on Main Street in Ashby. And there's 117 people, because that's Route 119, by the way. There's a lot of people. Uh, and oh, by the way, there's Chapter 61 forest land. That, by the way, is also land that can be brought out of forestry land. It's going to cost money. And yet, that's land that a builder could build on if they were willing to pay the taxes that had been deferred if it was 61 forest land. Same with, <coughs> excuse me, some of the field crops and stuff like that. There's land that's available. Um, so you can see Carlson bought a bunch of land here. Look at Jason Carlson bought up half of Main Street um, as a big giant farm. There's field crops and forest land. So he's paying virtually nothing in taxes on these properties. And then he's got mixed use agriculture and residential. And it's a duplex. So um, you could try to work with the Carlsons here, Georgette and Jason. Uh, let's take that out of farmland, turn it into a, a subdivision or a development. Condos, whatever. Um, at any rate, back to GeoFarm. Uh, the same thing that we would do with, I'm going looking for 
residents in my town who might be willing to sell because they were uh, they they didn't live in the property. I can do the same thing with people who live on Main Street. And so um, let's say I just listed and sold. Let's say I didn't list and sell. Let's say I know there was a property in the office that somebody listed and sold. I might go create a letter that says, Dear Mr. Homeowner, not sure if you saw this, but we just sold. <laughs> we just sold. Or you could say it this way. The property at 457 Main Street sold recently for this much money. Many people seem to be interested in the community, just curious if you've ever thought of selling. I can do that whether it was my listing or not. It's not illegal. Some agents might get grumpy at you if you did. Um, and the reality is that's a gray area where it's okay to do that. You're allowed to lead generate around sales that happened because you're just giving information. Don't say you sold it. If you didn't sell it, don't lie. And yet you can be vague if you want to. This is a personal comfort level thing, by the way. You may or may not be comfortable with that. That is totally fine. Um, it's, it's okay to do. <clears throat> so I could go create labels for every single one of these people. By the way, I would likely go through here and remove the ones that are the same one again and again and again and again, because I don't want to waste the stamps. Um, and I would uncheck those boxes and not send them 15 times, right? So I just go through and create the labels for the ones that I wanted. I could remove the ones that don't make sense. Ashby Main Street Association, LLC, don't know what that is. 1130 Main Street, I might look that up, save myself a stamp, might not be productive woodland. Houses, 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 the town of Ashby. Do you think they're gonna sell to me? I don't think so. They might. By the way, one of the ways that um, some of our commercial guys are making a lot of money right now is by rec representing communities in the sale of assets that are underutilized by communities. So if you have relationships with people in the community at the town hall, um, go talk to them about that. Say so you can go look up, by the way, look at this one. Ashby Town of, Ashby Town of, Ashby Town of, they own half of Main Street, right? So if you're having conversations with them, you go, are any of these properties, properties that you guys would want to dispose of or that are underutilized, they might be able to use them for something else. I would be willing to help you, you know, find somebody for that. <coughs> okay, so um, this is called circle prospecting when it's around a listing. So when I take a listing, I can do that. Right. I could create a postcard. By the way, if you were to go to command, and I know that uh, Anthony was here earlier on the on the call, he could tell you about postcards that are available, and you click a button, and it will create a postcard for you. They're right in command. And so I just listed, just sold. Those postcards are built in. You can either do one of two things. You can print them here at the printer in the office. You can download the file and bring it to a Kinko's or Copy Express or Staples or wherever else and have it printed. Or there's a company where you can actually just click a button and they'll print them for you and mail them for you. Uh, Michael Lewis Marketing Suite does things that are similar. So, um, and by the way, I do like the, the Michael Lewis Marketing Suite. They do, they do some really cool stuff. So you might want to use that instead, but that's just a personal choice thing, right? And so uh, just listed this place. And if you have agents in the office who are not going to be doing that and they say it would be okay for you to do that, just ask them, are you going to be prospecting via postcard and circle prospecting. If they say no, you could say, hey, would you be willing to let me do it? And then in the postcard, we're gonna say, hey, not sure that you saw this. We, Calories North Central, just listed the property at block. Let me know if you have any buyers who might be interested in moving in, being your neighbor. Are you allowed to write like numbers on there? Like for instance, like it just sold above blank asking price or Yep, you totally can. So yeah, so uh, I don't know if you guys could hear the question, but it was basically, can we write in information relative to the sale of the property? Yeah, given that it's, if it's something that you got permission for, you can write the specifics. Um, if it's somebody else's listing, as long as you don't claim that you did it, you can write down it's public record. It's a matter of public record, right? It's in there. We know what it's sold for. Um, this sold for this much money. Some people really like to know that. Um, so at any rate, uh, circle prospect, three three places that you might do it. One, Geo Farm. It's my neighborhood. I want to just get to know anybody. I haven't ever bought or sold anything in there. I'm just a brand new agent. I've done nothing. I just want to get to know people. Great. Go download the list of all these people, import it into 
your database and start working it. Number two, we just listed something there. Number three and four actually are, are one under agreement. You could send another one. Sold, you could send another one. By the way, there's a much better way to do this, which is this. Hi, Mr. Beals. I just want to introduce myself. My name is Mark Cavanaugh. I am a local realtor. I'm not sure if you noticed, but uh, we just are putting the house on the, the on the corner there on the market. And one of the things that I promised my client was that I would come by and introduce myself to all the neighbors. Uh, and so I'm just curious, uh, do you know anybody who might be looking to move into this neighborhood? And Mr. Beals says, blah, blah, blah. Yes, no, maybe so. Cool. Uh, Mr. Beals just wanted to let you know that we're going to be hosting an open house here on Sunday. Um, and there's going to be an open house for the local residents first, just for the first hour from 9 till 10. We'll be serving some pastries and um, some juice and stuff like that. Love to have you come take a look at the property just in case somebody does come to mind. And then after that, it will be open to the public. And so what that creates, by the way, you do this when you have a mortgage person who's willing to sponsor your juice and mimosas and Bloody Marys uh, and get insurance if you're going to do that because I don't want to get in trouble. Um, and make them pay for the pastries and coffee and whatever else. Uh, and, and go around and knock on all the doors. And don't wear dark suits or dark clothes because you look like you're selling religion. You don't want to look like you're selling religion when you're doing this. If you don't see them, uh, you could use a door hanger that shows that it was just listed and you can hang it on their door. So, um, so that is one thing. By the way, after it went under agreement, you'd come back and knock on the door and say, hey, Mr. Beals, it's Mark Catlin again. Just wanted to uh, say, hey, let you know we put that place under agreement. We had like 50 people through the open house. Um, and sorry you weren't able to make it to the, to the uh, just for the neighbor's open house, but I wanted to let you know that it's under agreement. We had like 50 people through. And what I can tell you from that is that there's huge interest in the property area in this area. And I'm just curious, do you know anybody else in the neighborhood who might be interested in selling? And now what happens is Mr. Beals immediately starts thinking, they got how much for it? Because that's what he's going to ask me. He's going to go, how much they get for it? And I go, I'm not at liberty to say, but I can tell you it was over asking price significantly. Um, and then he goes, yes, I know Sandra Leach down the street. She was talking about selling. Or he goes, maybe I'm thinking of selling. And so this is, I go get more listings, right? First, it's I go get buyers. When it goes under agreement, it's I go get more sellers. Then when it closes, I go back and do it a third time. Hey, Mr. Beals, it's Mark Cavan again. Just wanted to say, hey, we did close that place. Uh, here's what I wanted to do. I was hoping, by the way, this is one that I'm teaching for the first time ever, ever, because I heard it this morning and I loved it. Um, you bring a card with you, a welcome to the neighborhood card, and you say, Mr. Beals, it's Mark Cavan. I just wanted to let you know that the Smiths are taking possession of that property a little later on today. And so what I'd like to do is I was hoping that maybe you would be willing to sign a welcome to the neighborhood card. Would you do that for me? Great. Awesome. And you, uh, you take a picture with him. Mr. Beals, we're just going to shoot this. We're going to show it up on, on social media and just say, hey, welcome to the neighborhood. Are you comfortable with that? Yeah, great. Boom. Click a picture with Mr. Beals. Uh, have a card so that at closing, you have a welcome to the neighborhood uh, that you are able to give to them. These are all the neighbors that said welcome to the neighborhood. Uh, by the way, if that was my client, I may be mad at you. <laughs> But, um, but I would be okay with it, I guess. I wouldn't, I wouldn't show a stick. Um, so just letting you know, uh, that's something you could do too. Anybody have any questions on this? This is an interesting screen that we've been on for an awfully long time. So also you could be like, welcome Sally to the neighborhood. She just purchased blank, 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 one through Main Street. But like, you should obviously check with your client first because they might not want their face or their address like on the postcard. Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily do that. You could do that. Or their name and address. You could do that unless they're unless they're comfortable enough with them on there. That's for sure. Okay. Perfect. Um, by the way, uh, one other thing that when you have more money, or if you have somebody who's willing to sponsor something for you, um, one of the best things that you can do is host a welcome to the neighborhood party. And so the conversation then sounds like this: Hey, Mr. Beals, um, it's Mark again. I just wanted to say, hey. Uh, I've got this house under agreement. It's closing today. Would you be willing to sign this card um, just to say welcome to the neighborhood? That, by the way, it's Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Um, and here, here's the thing. Once he signs the card, here's the thing. Uh, we're going to be hosting a party 
for them, uh, just to say welcome to the neighborhood. Would you be willing to come? It's going to be next a month from now. It's going to be on the Thursday of the third third Thursday of the month, and it's going to be just a little pizza party get together so that they can meet the locals. Would you be comfortable coming to that? Would you like to get an invitation to that? Great. What would be the best email to send that to? Right now, I just capture his email. I could get his phone number. I could do whatever. You can capture information that way, um, and you introduce them to the neighbors, you bring them in. By the way, they say, don't do it the first week. They're way too stressed out. Um, do it maybe a, two weeks, three weeks afterwards, and you can host a party there at their house for them. Cater it, get it covered. Um, doesn't have to be anything extravagant, but you take care of the party. They don't want to have to do that. Um, and they get to show off their house, and then you can say to them, by the way, hey, Bill and Sally, uh, just wanted to let you know we're going to, if you're comfortable, I'd like to host a party here. We're going to have it catered. Um, and so we're going to bring in some food so that you can welcome, you know, you can be welcomed to the neighborhood by the, the neighbors. And also, I'd like to uh, invite you to bring in your friends and family so they can see the house, take a little pressure off you. Would, would you be happy with that? They go, absolutely, I'd be happy with that. Awesome. Who should I invite? Give me their names, numbers, email addresses, addresses. I'll send them an invite. And now I just captured all their friends. And oh, by the way, I'm the coolest thing since sliced bread since I'm hosting a party. You guys love that or what? Bunch of silent rats. I see you up there with just names. Go, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Mike. Go ahead, Chelsea. He just said, yo, Mark. I thought he had a question. I, I was telling him his mic was off. I, I mean, his mic was on. Muted. Uh, I said go Mark. Oh, oh sorry. I'm on fire today. All right. I, I, I don't know if I can handle talking to names all day. You guys are killing me. All right. Um, let's do this. Uh, it is five o'clock. Uh, why don't we take a two minute break? Because I need to go get a cough drop or something because I'm talking too much. You guys aren't talking enough. And then we're going to come back and we're going to take a look at some other tools coming out of the out of this thing. So we're going to come back in two minutes. It's four fifty nine. Why don't we do Why don't we do three minutes? We'll do five oh two. You guys good with that? Five oh two. I'm going to push pause on the recording. Someone has to remind me uh, to restart recording. When we come back. You guys cool with that? Pause. I think. Sorry about that. I think he was asking me asking you for me. Because I downloaded a CSV file of absentee owners in Fitchburg. Yeah. Um, and I was going to start doing mailings out to them to see if I could get a couple of leads there. But I really like the land idea because if you can link up with a couple of builders and build that relationship, no pun intended, then you can possibly have deals for years to come and kind of create a steady streamline of business, you know, and build the residential side of things while you kind of build a steady stream of business alongside it. Um, so, you know, from a steadiness perspective, I think that, you know, is, is an interesting idea to build off of. I can tell you that many of the top agents in our office have builders in their pocket. And right. so, um, and, and again, they have a steady stream. When you think about it, Mike, one of the best things about working with a builder is that Let's say you have a builder who's going to build 10 houses this year. I've got to keep one builder happy and I get 10 listings. If I have 10 friends, all of whom have one house, I have to keep 10 friends happy. It's much okay. easier to focus on, I need to keep this person and take excellent care of this person and make them really, really happy. And so that means, you know, take them to events, buy the guy lunch. Take them out for a steak dinner. That's a cost of business, right? The, the dinner is a cost of business. So take care of those people. Um, one of the coolest things that, that I ever saw done, um, and again, you guys do not have money to do this right now. However, um, Dan Loring used to work with tons of builders. And he still works with a bunch of builders, but he, he used to work with probably seven, eight builders at one time. And... One of the things he did, he owns tickets to the PACs. And so one, he bought them as a business expense so he could take builders to the game. And so if it's me or Mike, it's going to be the listing agent for me. And all things being equal, I'm paying five to him. I'm paying five to Mark. But Mark brings me to a Patriots game. Just guess who won? Right. Mark just won. And then... 
the thing that was cooler still was that when you have tickets to the Patriots, they used to have this thing where you could get on the team plane with them and fly to an away game. And so for, I think it was about a thousand bucks, you could hop on the plane with the Pats, fly to Denver, um, stay at the team hotel, uh, and then fly back on the same flight as the Patriots. They, by the way, they don't do this anymore, but this is a cool idea. And so the reason I, I bring it up is because you want to take care of your builders, of your attorneys who do uh, divorce work, of your attorney who does uh, estate work. Um, those, are, those are people you take exceptional care of. And so right. that trip, by the way, Dan brought three or four of his builders at any given year. And those guys are loyal to him to a fault for forever. Right. And right. talk about building a relationship. So again, you know, it costs money to do that, but he's selling 10 houses a year for them. And at the time it was probably a seven or $8,000 commission per deal. Um, so he's making 80 grand a year on you and he spends, call it 2,000, 3,000 by the time it's all said and done. Is that a good business use? Yes, of course. Right. It is. You can't That's be short sighted. By the yeah. way, much more fun than putting a, a sign on route two. Right, right, right. right. So, um, all right. Um, so it's 506. Who else has one that they like the idea of or wants to chat? Just the four of us? Just the four of us. It's Mike, Mark, Chels, and Joey. Uh, and we've got, we've got you two. We've got you. I want to put baby in the corner. Nobody puts baby in the corner. Do, do you have something that you like? Um, about, because I had a, I had a phone call, so I came a little bit later. What, what, which, what, which lead gen idea so far do you like the best? Um, the door knock idea I thought was really cool. I think the postcard idea is something I'm going to do in the near future. So that's why I'm like asking too many questions. So I apologize if I'm okay. asking too many. I think I've never done it before. And since I'm now closed on something in the market that I kind of want to gravitate towards, I think it's totally meant to be. The door knocking idea sounds great. I'm just scared that some people are like, you're being insensitive to COVID. And that freaks me out because I don't want them to be like, she's the insensitive willy nilly realtor of town. Yeah. So, um, Here's here's advice relative to door knocking, right? First of all, if it says do not trespass, don't go up the driveway, right? That's just rule number one. If they have camouflage fencing, don't go up the driveway. Um, if it is somebody who's known for having large hounds that will eat you, don't go up the driveway. Uh, if it is normal Joe Blow house, if you go up to the door, and I don't know if you guys have been taught this yet, but you knock on the door, and then you step back and turn yourself sideways. Because when you're sideways, you're not imposing. And when you're stepped back, you're in this, in this instance, you're respecting two things. One is I'm not in your grill. And that's even more important now for just the reason that Jess just mentioned, which is COVID is a thing. And so not everybody's the same level of comfort. Um, I would consider, by the way, I wouldn't necessarily wear a mask, but I would have one with me. Um, but I would step back more than six feet afterwards and I would turn myself sideways, particularly if you're a bigger person, um, turning sideways is really important and stepping back far enough that you're not up in their grill. Um, very, very important. And wait, by the way, and again, let me go back to the don't, don't look where like you're selling religion, dark suits, dark clothes, um, wear something a little bright, wear like a golf shirt or something like that, or a blouse, um, Weird to say that, Mike and Joey, you're looking at me funny now. Um, yeah, don't don't look like you're selling religion, I guess is the bottom line. So uh, a flyer or something like that. And, and again, understand that if you're trying to hand somebody something in COVID times, they might say, could you set it on the ground? And you can go like, I absolutely am fine. If you're you know not comfortable with me setting it on the ground, I could email it to you. Would that be preferable, right? Get an email address. That's a good way to capture an email anyway. Um, okay. And, in some towns in Massachusetts, you do need a license to knock on the door. So you would check with the folks down at the town hall. Uh, I believe it's called a tinkerer's license. Um, let's just Google it and see if we can find it. Might be permanent. Yeah, I don't see it. Uh, I will look that up and see what I can track down for you. I know in some towns, so just go down to the town hall and ask if you need one. Um, but there are permits that are required in some towns. Not every community has one. All right. 
Good question. Don't get in trouble. It's, if you guys get in trouble, it's completely your fault. No. <laughs> oh, we just hit record. I did. I okay, recorded. Perfect. Sorry. Thank you for reminding me. Um, by the way, while we're here, I should also mention this. If you go make phone calls to people, because you can, once you get the public record and you find them, oh, let me go back to another thing. Uh, we have an office account for this company, Spokio.com. Um, and so if you call Kat at the front desk, she can help you figure out what the login and password are, and you can go log in. Um, and when you get there, you can do searches for people based on reverse phone number searches. You can do it based on name. You can do it for a thousand different ways um, by address. Um, and so we could have gone and, oh, it doesn't know who I am. Somebody changed the password. Um, don't change the password, by the way. It screws up 30 people. Oh, no, it did work. Um, so, yeah, so let's see. Um, Jess, what's your phone number? 978-837-8959. Yeah. I'm not going to get a bunch of people calling me. Let's now. just see if it works. Um, we're going to search by phone number. You might take that. Yeah, Peter. Yep. So we just tracked down Peter. Um, and there's information about Peter. It's a possible match. There's where he lives, according to them. He used to live there. Um, he's also related to Elizabeth, Pamela, that's Patricia, T, um, Peter J. That's Anybody a possible come after match. My family, I'll come after you. <laughs> that's right. That she's Italian, you know, guys. Um, so the, again, we have this tool for you guys. We pay for it. So um, you can do searches. If you click this button here, the download PDF one, it, we only have a certain number of reports, but you can do unlimited searches. So um, search, don't PDF. PDFs are useless anyway. Uh, you can also look the social. It's not finding social profiles for her. Um, I think there's a bunch of spam calls now, like spam. No. Okay, perfect. And I'm just going to check and see if it finds social profiles for me so I can show you guys what it looks like. I don't know that it will. I think I don't have any of that. So again, the reason I bring this up is because if you're doing public record searches, you find somebody, now we know the name of the trustee, now we can go look at the name of the person here based on a town and an address um, and try to find it. It goes through and scans all the public records that it has access to. Um, and so it includes too many, right? So there's not every single one is the right one, and yet there are a bunch that are there. Um, when you do it by email address or phone number, it tends to be more specific. Uh, when you do it by name, it's obviously going to be a little convoluted. So it's coming. Uh, it's found me. There are 34 social networks, apparently. God bless America. I am a busy man. Um, three profile matches. It found me on LinkedIn. It found me on Pinterest. It found me on MySpace. Oh, dear. Um, I don't know that I ever created that account, so that might be someone else. Uh, and then it finds MCAV and Instagram. These are probably not me, right? These are the other MCAVs in the world. That is clearly not me. Um, however, you guys get the drill, right? Some of them were definitive. Yes, we found this. This is the email address that was used. Others are, it was an all, another MCAB. That might be them. So at any rate, um, it's part of the research phase. So let's close this out. Let's close this out. Let's close this out. And let's do this. Actually, I say let's do this. And yet, I don't know that I know my account login and password. Look at that. I love Google. Google knows my login and password. You said it's free to make a regular account? Yes. You guys can go create accounts using your MLS ID, uh, and you will have a free version of the account. There is a paid version of the account that is going to do some heavy lifting on, um, on analytics for you. But this information is going to start. So let's just start, right? Let's go look. Um, a search. And we can search as much as we want. Um, we just can't throw them in the cart. Uh, search as I move the map. Let's blow it up from the fullest down the drive. That's where I live. So 
we can go look at properties that are active. We can sort them by how they were found. We can draw things on the map. By the way, I, I got super tight. Um, this is my house, actually. I was think I was wondering, wanting to see if it was there. Um, and so it shows, okay, this one was canceled. By the way, can, oh, that's another thing we should do. So uh, bring me back to this in a minute. We're at Remind for now, but bring me back to expireds, not canceled, expireds is what we're going to go back and look at, expires. Um, it, so uh, where's my, there it is. Oops. Oops, I got crazy. <laughs> All right, let's go look at a property. Um, let's look at property. Okay, so this is a single family residential. It was on the market for 112 days. Built in 02, 4,486 square feet. We can create a CMA using this thing. We can get information about it. This is all public record stuff. It's pulling straight from public records. Um, it shows you who listed this. Maureen is mean, by the way. If you ever have a deal with Maureen, she's a mean, mean, mean lady. Oh. <laughs> I'm not, not saying that to, to, to tell you that she's mean, but she's mean. <laughs> she's not nice. She's not nice. She used to be nice probably 100 years ago. Um, okay, so at any rate, um, it's got all sorts of information. What it also does is it allows you to search by filters. And some of the filters that you can search by, by the way, you should go take the, the class on this. I think it's right in MLS. Let me actually find out if it's there under the, uh, and then I'm gonna show you where to find that. Training library. And there should be some classes on that. This right here, third-party videos, Home Snap Pro, courtesy of MLS Pin. No, that's not it. There should be one right there. <laughs> it's not there. I don't see it. Um, that's another one you guys have access to. Is Home Snap Pro, by the way. Uh, where's Remind? I don't see it. Okay, they didn't put a they didn't put a, a thing in there. Um, so here's what I would tell you: Go take a live class under any of these things. <clears throat> see if it's here. Yeah, no, it is Remind Basics. It is there. Um, so Remind Basics is there. You want to take that class. It's an hour and a half class. You would register for the class and go take it. When you go there, you'll learn all sorts of cool stuff. Um, you should do that. No, no kidding. Um, by the way, most of the MLS pin classes, if you go take them uh, with a live instructor, at the end of the class, they usually have some time left over and you can get some crazy, crazy cool information from them. And you guys, I will tell you this, if you haven't taken the classes or watched these videos, there's about 95% of the of, uh, tools that are available in MLS pin you have no idea how to use. And they're wonderful, wonderful tools. So you should go do that. Um, okay, back to Remind for a second. Um, advanced, I think is what we wanna look at. Oh. Yeah, that's a pro search now. It used to be that it was you got a couple of searches for free. It looks like they've stolen that from us. Um, you used to be able to search for how many houses uh, were likely to sell, and it would give you a ranking, and you could search by the number of rankings. But now, let's go see if we can do something different. I'm just zooming in, guys. I want to see if I can find. The specific information that I want to share with you. Okay, I'm 
recognize that it is, but I thought I was, they changed it on me. <laughs> So what do we got here? There we go. See at the top here where it says how long they've owned it? Owned for 30 plus years by Dorothy N. Davis, R.E.T. and Dorothy Davis Realty Trust. That's, so that's Dorothy Davis Realty Trust and Dorothy Davis lives there. Um, so 37 Champney was on the market for 93 days and expired. So you can go through here, um, find expired properties. Um, by the way, remind me again, go back to expired in the, uh, the MLS in a moment, but we can use it through here. And we can go track down. This is somebody I should be reaching out to. By the way, I'd, I'd first go, how long has she owned it? 30 plus years? I'd go check and see if she's still alive first. Um, that would be the first thing I would do. Um, but it shows information about the property. It, it used to have a score, guys, of what the likelihood was for her to move. I think it's probably still here somewhere. Here's the FEMA map. Like it's basically just going everywhere that it can to pull public information and grabbing things, which is super cool too. You should do this when you go to sell a place before you put it on the market because it's grabbing all sorts of stuff that you can then grab and attach. <coughs> Here we go. There's the value of the house. Her net equity is estimated at 479,000. She's estimated at 100% equity, the whole amount. So when we go look at these things, it tells you how long they've lived there. It tells you um, what they're estimating the equity to be. It's doing that from public record. So what it basically does is it goes in the public record, grabs the mortgage information, has the year, assumes the basic interest rate. She's been there for 20 years, great. It's a 30 year mortgage. She's got 10 years of payments left based on when she got that mortgage, unless it was changed. That was assumed it's this rate. That was the average rate back then. This is about what she should owe. And so it kind of knows that it's making a guess, but it's got a pretty good estimated guess. Um, and that's worth looking at. Um, got assessment values, it's got the property history. Go look at the deed. She closed on the property here, sold for fifteen hundred bucks, sold for two thirty two, bought it before that for two twenty four. These are mortgages, you guys. Um, there's mortgages: two hundred thousand in the 06, 57,000 in ninety three, twenty thousand before that. Talks about the valuations. Red pen. Those rats. Um, okay. If we pay more money, it's going to show scores. <laughs> Got to pay them money. Those public record guys. It, by the way, this is one of the tools that I would say uh, likely is worth paying for if you're going to use it. If you're not going to, by the way, use the free version first. And if you find yourself using it, then maybe you want the information it's willing to is you're willing to pay for it because it is a very, very powerful tool. Um, okay, I'm gonna not show you any more Remind. I'm gonna go back and show you where to go get the class. Okay, so let's go here under MLS pin. We clicked on the courses button and it showed us courses. You scroll on down and it's under, what was it, third one down? Third page, Remind Basics. Okay, all right. We're out of Remind. You guys saw that, by the way, right? Training library. Courses. Did I hit courses? I hit COVID-19. <laughs> Oops. Uh, courses is what we want. Um, so learn courses. Um, and you can get there from within MLS PIN once you're signed in, or you can get there if you're just at MLS PIN without signing in. You can you can see what the training library looks like and sign up for classes. Okay, this goes away, we're back to energy. All right, um, another idea. And then I think this is probably the last idea because your brain might explode and you might do nothing if I keep teaching you more things to do to go get lead generation. 
It used to be back in the day that people would list properties and about 60 to 65% of the listed properties would sell, which left somewhere in the 30 to 40% range typically of properties that did not sell the first time around. You guys are familiar with this? It's called an expired property. And so here's one thing that we can do that a lot of people are not aware of. We know everybody who expired if we do a search for expired properties. And this is the way that it would work. We go into search. By the way, we could do it for today. And we could just go look for expired properties. Um, in a, we could do it in a community, right? Or we can do it in a coverage area. There's mine. It's the towns I used to work. Um, and so we're going to do that. We're going to look for expired properties. Okay, so let's go back up. And we just chose expired. And it says today minus six months. So this is basically everything going back in the past six months that has not sold that expired. Okay, I just venture it. Yes, guys, out of these, what is it? 15 towns, 10 towns, a dozen towns. By the way, look where they're at. They're in Middlesex County for the most part, um, and a few in Worcester County. Um, take a look. Oh, you can already see the number. <laughs> 23 expired. Okay, I was going to have you guys guess how many have expired in six months. That's not normal. That's completely abnormal. Um, and yet, let's go take a peek at it. So if I wanted to, I could go try to reach out to these people. One of the most important things I could do, however, is go look in active MLS right now, because just because it expired with this person doesn't mean that it's gone forever. It doesn't mean that someone else didn't list it. So Compass lost it. Jennifer Russo lost it. Um, she had it marketed for 12 days and then just boom, it fell off the market for some reason. She listed it back in October. Uh, it came off the market in March. What that means is they listed in October, they let her keep it on the market for 12 days and then they pulled it off the market and it went through March and then expired. And so what you could do is after you go search to make sure it's not actively listed right now and being marketed, you could walk down to 88 Ann Lee Road and knock on the door and say, hey, uh, my name is Mike Ledger. I just want to introduce myself. Uh, I'm a local realtor and I, I specialize in selling homes that didn't sell the first time around. I'm just curious, where were you going if you moved? And you can use the scripts from Ignite or you can make up your own. Um, but that would be one thing you could do or you could send her a letter. And that's more, you know, it's more efficient and it's less friendly and you're less likely to get the results. And yet if there were 500 of these, I might send letters. Guys, there's 23 of them, right? There's not enough for it to be a problem. Like I could go knock on these during, during a weekend. If I don't have anything else going on, I could go do this. Hey, 35 Air Road. By the way, first thing I do is I make sure it's not actively listed. Some of these will be, by the way. They expired and then somebody listed them again. Why do houses expire, you guys? Seller's not as motivated. So Jess says because the seller's not motivated. They're not as motivated. What do you guys say? Would it be if they found something wrong? What is it? Would there be if they found something wrong? Maybe. Anyone else have a reason why things expire? Overpriced the market. There we go. Boom. That's the only reason. They expire. Well, again, that's not really the only reason. But if they marketed it the whole time, what Jess just said is that the, the house was overpriced. It could be one of two things, technically. <coughs> it was overpriced. It was not marketed correctly. There's a third that we talk about, which is condition. And the reality is that if priced correctly, everything sells no matter what the condition. So it's just a function of did they market it well? Did they price it right? Because if those two things are met, conditions irrelevant. It will have been priced for the condition. So just understand that these have, by the way, take a look at this one. 35 Air Road in Harvard listed at 925. Nancy is notorious for overlisting properties because she wants to keep the value of the town up. You're moving. I don't care about you. It's everybody else who lives in Harvard that I want to take care of for the rest of the time. 
So she overprices properties and they sit for months and months and months. Um, and then they expire. And that's okay because she's kept the value of the town up and everybody appreciates that and still lives in town. So, um, by the way, there's 48 Boston Road in Groton. There's 18 Cambridge Street in Air. That's a condo. Careful in condos, knocking on doors. Um, 11 Crabtree in Shirley. That's actually another condo. So those are standalone condos. Look at there were multiple offers received on the property. Deadline is 3.15 at 5 p.m. Wonder what happened there. Decided they didn't like the price. Um, to Derby Drive and Shirley, that's a builder. So, so Mark, like, why would you see, so I'm kind of going through Fitchburg because that's kind of my area. I'm kind of shadowing what you're doing a little bit here. Uh, but would there be one that expired, say, for like 25 days? And you pull up the house, it looks like a new-ish house, and it looks like, say, reasonably priced or, or something along those lines. You know, why, why in some of those instances would those be pulled off the market? Would it be, you know, the seller gets cold feet or something like that? Yep. That's probably the most likely reason. Okay. Maybe something financial on the seller's end? It could be. It could be a lot of things. They could, they could here, here's one thing that happens, Mike, right? In today's market, we get it under agreement. It's on the market for a couple of days. I start looking at houses. I realize I can't find something where I want to go. Sure. Back out and go screw that. I, I had it subject to sale. I had subject to finding suitable housing or something like that. Um, sure, sure. You know. So <clears throat> now that said, normally I would, I would think that they would spend sixty days trying to do it. But uh, which one were you looking at? No, I was just kind of rolling through. I'll try and pick one out for you. Um, and like what I've noticed too is kind of especially in bigger cities, like people are squatting in a lot of the properties. So it's like to convey vacant property if they can't get the first. Now, some investors are like, it's not even worth my attorney. We're dealing with it. Yeah, like, I don't know if you've heard that. What, there are people who are living in properties and the investor tries to get them out and they can't. They go, I want to sell it with the person living in there. You go take care of it. And everyone's like, no. I showed <laughs> that. That was Jill's, Jill's saucer's listing. This one here? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I see like 119 Stickney Road. I don't know if you have that one up. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there it is. So yeah, days on the market six. Now the question is, okay, so let's let's say we wanted to find this property, 119 Stickney, right? So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back and make sure it's not listed again. They could have done a kissing contest with the agent. Right? Yeah, this is like a good activity to go through too, like. For me to learn the routine of actually looking up an expired. Okay, so um, check it out. There's two. So guess what's going to happen? One's going to be active or under agreement. It's going to be a new listing. Expired here and it's active. So it's currently listed with Doug Tamlin. Oh no, that look. No, that's 160. Okay, one. different house. Different house. So yeah, you're so you're expired. So it came off the market after six days. So my answer to that is um, weird, right? They came off the market on, so they listed it on 1014. They were on the market for six days, off market 430. By, by that, it means they, they pulled it off, withdrawn or something like that. Probably was an issue with it. Comes back on. So Corian Carboni Petrocelli took this listing. And for some reason, it came back off. I would go check to see if it sold off market. So now I go to the public records and see, did they pull it off? Because you know what these guys are famous for? Yeah, pocket listings. So 99% chance this is a pocket listing that they sold. And then because they sold it off market, they're not allowed to show it as having sold because that's the foul that you get for doing it that way. So let's go look. 119 Stickney Road. So what's the benefit for them doing that? Do they not have to pay the buyer uh, buyer agent commission or something? No, they double ended in house. <clears throat> it's um, really? it's highly. 
Okay, so it's not in the best interest of the seller in my mind. And so if I was to say to you four people here in the room, Mike, Chels, Joey, and um, I was gonna say Mark, but it's not really Mark, it's Jess. Um, so the four of you guys, if I was to say, hey, look, I've got a listing, um, you guys bring your buyers first. And the four of you guys each had a buyer for it and you brought it to the, to the open house that I held for you guys, or I let you guys get in there early. And then I brought four offers to the seller and said, I've got four offers for you. Pick the best one. That's not good for the seller because you're leaving out the, the rest of the people. Yes. Who could put offers in on the house. Yes. And so that's could have the, an, all, an all cash offer for a hundred grand more than those four offers. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the argument is I've made life easier for them and they're assigning documents that say it's okay that we do this. But the reality is that they're using something called Mamakia links that they brag about. And it's basically, we let it, we let the agents and there's other companies that do this, by the way, it's just the, um, the national association of realtors created something called, um, well, I don't want to get too, too, too far into it, but they basically said pocket listings are illegal. Don't do that. Um, and they made the MLSs change the way that they do things last year. This is going, going back like a year. Uh, and so that behavior has always been frowned on and it's potentially lawsuit land because the sellers look down and go like, oh, you're telling me this is the best thing to do. And I say, absolutely it is. And it's not, it's not in your best interest, right. um, but I tell you it is. And then you sign something that says, I understand that it's not really the smartest thing in the world to do. And so you, you, I protected myself because you signed documentation that said it's, you understand, you totally get that it's not the, the entire market. And yet I brought you multiple offers and you're happy and you should go away happy. Well, the reality is just like you said, Mike, they likely did leave money on the table. And so- Interesting. Oh, interesting. Yeah, interesting. So, so that's what's going on. And so uh, let's go back. We're looking at 119 Stickney, right? So let's go to Worcester County okay. Registry of Deeds. We'll do a quick search. Search the records, search our records. This is the Worcester County Registry, right? We looked at Middlesex already, so we're gonna go back. It's built basically the same. Let's go to a property search. Ooh, did I go to the right one? 119.60. Question is, is Worcester in here? Is it, uh, no, hold on. Was Fitchburg in here? Oh, I think it might be under... It's under the different Worcester County Registry deeds. Right, because this one didn't have it. Okay. Worcester South. Is she related to my team? I don't know. Uh, maybe. Where's the other one? <laughs> there's there's multiple registries, guys, for each, for each one. There's one that has them all. Let's see. How about we go Fitchburg? We'll type in Fitchburg registry and see if we can find it. I think that's the one in the chat. There you go. Mm -hmm. Oh, you threw it in the chat? Uh, find my property records. You see, they're all ish the same. So we've got one that was recorded in 89, one that was recorded in 1993, 96, 2001, 2003. I could have put a date range. It would have been smart of me. <laughs> they do a lot of things here. We're up to 2004. I don't know why 
we're doing this, because I'm feeling like sleuthing. Um, but this is what we would do, right? We just go in here and find out and go like, oh, it got it got pulled off the market. The reality is it probably just sold. It, it just sold as a pocket listing. So many of those you'll see now. Um, while we're talking about that, let's go back in time. So um, five years ago, four years ago, there were properties, and I'm getting all sorts of stuff now. Um, at any rate, modify the search. So let's just do 2021. Doesn't like that, huh? Could we possibly look um, on the listing and public record? MMDDYYO, no slashes. It's going to get mad at me for a date that hasn't passed yet. No, it didn't do it. Was it 2020? Um, oh, maybe it didn't happen, guys. Maybe that didn't happen. Uh, maybe it hasn't closed yet. Maybe it's getting ready to close. Um, so at any rate, but I'm, I'm, I'm willing to bet money that that's what's either happening or happened. Um, so, okay, so let's go back in time. There was a time when houses fell off the market. And the reason they fell off the market was because almost half of them didn't sell. Um, through no fault of the agent, through no fault of the marketing necessarily, through no fault of the, the, the price, it was not necessarily the problem. It was that there were not as many buyers who were fighting and stabbing each other to get the, the listings. So uh, in a normal market, somewhere between, like I said, a quarter and half of the houses don't sell. Uh, and what we can do is we can go back and talk to those people. So one of the things that we would do is go back and we would do a expired search. Come on, unselect all. We would do an expired search, and instead of today minus six months, we would do a date range, um, off market time frame, 01, 01, 2018 through 12, 31. It's gonna get mad at me. You think? Let's count it and see. Wow, 9,613 in MLS pin expired in that year. Um, so that said, these are what we call old expired, you guys. So let's grab just the towns there and count again. We're down to 184. So in the towns that I typically go after, 184 expired that year. I could print the list of that, right? It would look like this. And then my responsibility is to go back and see, has it closed since? Right, so I would go from photo summary, I would go to the one line and I would pull the properties. And so now I've got 20 Elm Street movement. By the way, I would probably do this on a one town. Yeah, let's go back and do that real quick. I would do it on one town by one town, right? So let's get rid of all the towns. Um, and we're just gonna grab Acton. And so now we count 30 houses in Acton expired that year. And so these are people who at one time decided they wanted to sell. And so here's the thought process. Why didn't they? What changed? And so now that's the information I'm trying to gather. Hey, Mike, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Mark Cavan. I understand that you were looking to sell back in the day. And I'm just curious, have you, you know, where were you going to go if you moved? And he goes, I was going to Arizona. Cool. What was the impetus behind that? Well, I was going there because I had a job change. Oh, so I take it you didn't, you're not commuting to Arizona, are you? No, the job fell apart. I decided to stay here. Oh, great. Well, um, you know, I was just reaching out because blah, blah, blah. Maybe start a conversation. It's just starting a conversation. Um, if he says, yeah, no, I was moving there to see my, you know, my family. That's where I'm from. I wanted to move there and blah, blah, blah. Then, then we start going down the line of why did you want to move? Is it still applicable? If it is, let's talk about why it might make sense now. And so that's a go get listings thing. So these houses, we go look and see, have they sold since? Kim Albertelli had 38 Main Street, it expired. Chances are, if it didn't sell then, they might still have interest in selling. If they do, start a conversation, see where it goes. Kim Albertelli is not gonna be mad at you that you went, she went and did that. You know, if she, she should have stayed in touch with them. Eliza Spence should have been in touch with the people over at Quail Run. And so these are houses. And so this is called old expires. And so um, there's two ways to do expires, right? 
One is to, from the home screen, if you wanted to do a search, you could do a search called a hot sheet. And every day it would tell you what happened today in this town. And I'd go click on it and it would say, well, everything went under agreement and nothing sold. Um, and there's nothing expired. And you go, oh, got it. So things went under agreement and sold, but nothing expired. Okay, great. If something expired, you could reach out to them and say, hey, it looks like your house just came off the market. Um, in MLS, I was just curious, have you made plans yet to relist it? They go, yeah, I, I didn't realize it was off the market. I go, well, if your agent, Mike Ledger, didn't, he, he, uh, it's, it's expired. So just curious, you know, are you gonna, you planning on moving still? And they go, yes, no, maybe so. Well, they say, yeah, I'm actually relisting with Mike. Great, thanks so much. I'll hope to bring a buyer. It just, so that's the expired today routine. There's the expired six months, a year ago routine. Um, and again, the, they expired six months ago that's an old expired. Nobody's talking to them anymore. A lot of people make a business out of going and talking to the one expired today. And when I say that, I mean many agents who like to work expireds like the ones that expired today because now it's a listing. They raised their hand, said, I want a list and I'm willing to pay an agent. And now it didn't sell. So now I'm the one who specializes in selling homes that didn't sell the first time. And I go do that. So that's expired today. The ones that went six months ago, a year ago, they may or may not be as motivated. Um, and yet, if you rekindle the spark of why they were looking to go, this is an emotional thing. It might still be there and you can help them build the list and sell. And oh, by the way, their house might be worth enough money now that if they overpriced it before, it might be worth what they thought it was. So, all right, it is 546. We've been talking for lots and lots of time about lots and lots of things. Is there anything else that you guys would like to talk about relative to lead generation through MLS PIN? This is the interactive part where those of you not in the room would have to come on and say if you wanted to learn something different. So I'm not sure this part is like the lead generation part, but for a CMA, like to gather, like for instance, a listing, like if you have a listing appointment, would that be anything? And which one is the complementary? Is it comparative market analysis? Because I know Toolkit and CMA was like free with my old brokerage, but I'm not sure. Toolkit should be free. Okay, it's free on here too? Yep. Perfect. Is there a difference between the two? Uh, so let me go back to screen share. So under the tools section, you're talking about, did you talk about cloud CMA? Did you grab it from tools? Did you grab it from the from tools? Yeah, it's under the tools section too. Create complimentary CMA reports, buyer tours, property reports, and property flyers. Cloud CMA is still part of your free tool. <coughs> There is also comparative market analysis, which is market analysis that is allowed to be created through MLS PIN technologies. Cloud CMA is a third party provider that we have partnered with via MLS PIN that will allow you to do some pretty cool stuff. Um, some people love it. We also have broker metrics, which would allow you to do that. So you could do it through broker metrics. That's one that very few people have. Most agents you guys are going to use this or they're gonna use this if they're old school and don't never learn how to use Cloud CMA, or they're going to use this RPR. And RPR is the Realtor Property Resource and you can create a CMA for somebody that's 50 pages long and you can do it in about two minutes. That's a different class. And yet I'll show you for 10 seconds. <laughs> um, You create this account with your uh, your realtor ID, your NRDS number. Um, anyone remember the address we had? One nineteen. What? What's it? Stickney. Stickney. Yes. Thank you. So this is RPR, the Realtor Property Resource. It's going to pull the information that it got. <coughs> Look at that thing. It's on the side of a hill. Um, it's about to fall into the hill. Uh, we would go create a CMA. So let me do something so I can actually see what I'm doing. You guys apologize for this. Oh, no. Okay. It's going to be a little dark, but at least you'll be able to see the screen. It's now I can see the screen. Um, okay. So I go in here and they moved things on me. And I say, I'd like to create a CMA. It says it's an off-market property. I say, yes, it is off-market. In fact, it says, you want to confirm the facts? I look through and I go, yep. And I change the data if I want to. 
and I confirm the facts and I close it. By the way, if we know that there's difference, oh goodness gracious, let's say it's, I don't know what it is, three, one, I don't know. What else is it want? So we confirm the facts close. Normally, by the way, it just grabs the information. Chances are that there's something wrong with that one. Um, the information wasn't there, so there's something wrong. So now we go find comments. And so we can do it a lot of different ways. We can use a custom area. We can draw the shape. Let's draw a polygon. Uh, let's make it smaller. Let's say I only want properties who are here, here, it's not going to be any houses in here, but that's okay. <laughs> Let's say we only want this because it's search in this area. <laughs> yeah, no property, I told you, I made it too, too small. Let's, uh, let's use, let's use the zip code. Um, Search this area. I'm not finding any properties. Fitchburg, Massachusetts, a lot or land. Oh, that's why. It's looking for lots. Talk about crazy. So that's a lot, you guys. That's why it's not finding any information. That house is a teardown. 119 Stickney, what a problem. Um, so it's only looking for lots. So we would need to change that. <clears throat> All right, that makes it much less useful. Let's go do something else. Who's got a house they want to enter? Oh, they're rentals. We'll see how we do. It's 552, if you have to leave, you have to leave, got it. Uh, okay, so we've got property 544 Erickson Road. Let's go back to CMA. It says it's off market. Confirm the facts. Let's edit that. Uh, there we go. Those facts look about right to me. How about you guys? You said yes, looks right. Public record is completely correct. We go back in. Oh, look at that. We're, we've adjusted it. It's worth $16,000 less. Uh, let's edit the comps. So we're just going to basically do a search. We'll just use the geography within the zip code. Ashby, Massachusetts, it's finding houses. It's going to go look for houses that are closed, pending, active, single family. It does some searches. I don't care if it's got a certain number of beds and baths. I'm going to look for a living area, whatever. Um, it's pulled these houses. Let's update the valuation. Didn't actually go out. Let's search. So it found 21 properties, and we go, oh, this one looks perfect. Let's add that to the list. Good. Uh, this one looks perfect. Let's add that to the list. We can, you know, whatever. We grab whichever one we think that one looks good. Let's add it to the list. This one does not look good. This one does not look good. This one looks good. Add it to the list. That looks good. Add it to the list. Now we do this. Okay. So let's say that was all we wanted. These are all closed, right? We update the valuation and close. It's going to come up with a new number for us. Um, now it's just come up with this. It says it's now worth 394,000. It's got a range of 291 to 488. It's 168 bucks per square foot. I could adjust it, by the way, um, by going in here and saying, I like this property. I don't like this one. This one's better than mine. That one's worse than mine. Um, you slide the bar. It would change it. Uh, we click this button, create report. It says, what kind of report do you want to create? I say, I want to create a seller's report. Run the report. That's it. I just created a 50 page report. Mark out based on the five comps that I picked up. Um, and it'll go ding dong when it's done. That's it. Um, okay. So when you get those reports, by the way, <clears throat> I'll show you what they look like. Well, they only keep it for 30 days. I thought I had one. Um, they only keep it for 30 days. It, you should download them, by the way, when you create them. So we'd have to wait for it to go ding dong. Okay. Any questions on that one? <laughs> you should go learn how to use that too, by the way. Um, all right. Joey already knows how to use it, so he rolled out. Chelsea, any questions? Mike, any questions? No. I'm here. You're here and no questions. Good. You've got plenty of ways to go lead generate should you choose to through the tools available in MLS PIN. 
There's training available for many of the tools in MLS PIN right under the MLS tag under tools and under education. And if you have questions relative to RPR or I didn't talk about every door direct today, but that's a way to send postcards cheap um, or things like that. Let us know. We can, we'd love to help you out. And again, um, we didn't even go into things like the Facebook lead accelerator um, that's available through command. So this was just MLS pin lead generation techniques to get expired listings, circle prospecting listings, um, geo farm listings, builders. What else did we cover? Expireds, recent and previous, way previous expired. So there we go. Go learn fun things and do fun things, and we'll see you guys soon. Next well, week from Tuesday, a week from last Tuesday is, um, what are we doing? We're doing off put submitting offers. We're doing a workshop on submitting offers uh, for Coach's Corner. It's going to be live if you can make it. And then, um, if, lest I forget, tomorrow is a party at Pelly's house. You guys should plan on being there and bring some Cobricks if you want. We're going to have some beverages and some bags and fun. All right. Cheers, guys. Good to see you. Thanks, Mark. See you. Um, one moment, Mark. Can I show you my business cards? Yeah. I'm going to stop recording and yeah.